So welcome back after this great lunch. You come with me, Hugo? <laughs> yes. Merci, <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> in Rio, we kissed twice. Uh, you, in Paris, too. Two. Oh, yes, okay. In yes. Sao Paulo, just one. Ah, okay. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, Do you know why? No. In Sao Paulo, they know how to make money. In Rio, we know how to spend money. Ah, okay. And it's much better with a lot of cases <laughs> to do that. Very good. So this morning we had, um, we had SESC, um, a really interesting model based in uh, Sao Paulo, um, a private um, organization. Now we have a uh, foundation, uh, foundation. So it's really interesting to see the Roberto Marino. When did you open? 40 years ago. F 40 years ago. Yes, yes. 40 years ago. So now you're going to explain us the model and, uh, and what is the foundation uh, doing and how education, again, I mean, we saw how the Brazil is doing it in Sao Paulo and now you're going to, to explain how you do it in Rio. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you, Corinne. Well, um, thank you very much, Corinne. Thank you, Agenda to be here again. This is my third participation on your conferences, Corinne. Uh, this means that I like a lot to be here, and perhaps you know, like a little bit a lot also to have me here. And um, the first one was in, in Metropolitan, I think in 2012. The second one was last year in Quebec. And what is interesting in this kind of meeting, I think the best is really to share experiences is really to try to learn a little bit. Uh, one of our premises on everything we do in Brazil, in, in Roberto Marino Foundation, is uh, based on the idea that everyone has a knowledge to share. Even the poorest person from a very poor community. This is a principle of a very important Brazilian educational, theoric, uh, pedagogic person called Paulo Freire, who has already died, and he built this idea of sharing the knowledge from everyone in every place and every moment. I think this is the best idea to have in mind for us that, we, that work with museums. And this is The, the, one of the premises that is going to guide my presentation today. First, I would like to say that uh, I will try to develop a reflection around this subject, museums as sites for connection, social mobilization, and education. And of course, based on our experience in Brazil. Of course, we are not saying that museums do not have to collect to organize the exhibitions. But this is our main mission. But what else we should try to design, to develop, to change this, let's say, a stereotype of museums in the 21st century, in this post-modernity? We are this liquid society, this so fast society. I think this is what I want to address a little bit. But I have to say some words about who we are. Roberto Marino Foundation, uh, it was founded on the premise of using communication as a tool to promote education and transformation. We are a family foundation supported by the shareholders of Global Media Group, that is the major media group in Latin America. We run newspapers, magazines, uh, radios, t national televisions, networks, uh, pay TV systems, uh, internet, and all that. And uh, the foundation was created by the founder of the group. And uh, one of the branches of the foundation is exactly culture and heri national heritage. And during these last 15 years, we have been working, creating new museums in Brazil. We conceive museums as sites of education connected to art and science, but also sites where <coughs> we promote social mobilization, places to arouse the desire for knowledge. 
In the last 15 years, as I mentioned, we have created six museums very popular. Perhaps I think we connect also with the know-how of this symbolic language as a media group people. Uh, we create interesting narratives on the museums. All of these museums, almost all, five at least of them, are experiential museums with a lot of audiovisual stuff, uh, games, uh, uh, interactive stations, but also the museum, the Art Museum of Rio, Mar, is an art museum connected to a school. I'm going to explore a little bit in a few minutes. And these museums, they become the most visited in Brazil during these last 10 years, about 11 to 12 million people already. And we truly believe in the empowerment of education in any, but in any museum activity. Education is the beginning and the end of everything. Education should be, must be, the ethical reason for a museum existence. It is important to understand also, and this I, I really like to discuss, what is the role of museums in the 21st century. Now, we have to understand that the role of museums is changing a lot. Over the last decade, museums have undergone big transformations, especially in the way they relate to their audiences. Museum visitors are no longer just passive consumers. They are now active participants in cultural and community life. They want to share their visits on social media. They want to circulate information. They want to engage in dialogue. They want to provide feedback. They want even to create content and mobilize other visitors. This is the new paradigm for us to understand this new metabolism of our mainstream visitors. And it's, I, I'd like to share with you this example, very interesting, that happened last year in New York. In the wake of 2016 presidential election, New York City gained a public art project called Subway Therapy. It was a wall in the Union Square subway station. It started when artist Matteo Chavez invited commuters to scribble their post-election feelings on post-its. Within a month <coughs> of the election, the project had metastasized all over the station with thousands and thousands of sticks, notes spreading throughout the, ho <coughs> the halls of the subway station offering messages of hope, anger, solidarity, and much more. After Trump, a lot of people want to say something. And the, the power of this huge engagement provoked a long discussion in the New York society about whether the installation should be preserved or not. Look at how interesting. This example shows exactly reveals exactly the eagerness of this contemporary eagerness of participation of the common people. When they go to a museum, when they go to see an exhibition, and even when someone puts a seed and this grows like this in a public train station. Of course, the authorities of the transportation public system, they decided to took it away. But it, be, it seems that I heard it's going to be a book. This is the reason that we try to understand museums as a dynamic, a living organism with its pulsation, synchronized with the local communities. With this attitude, we try to incorporate the aspiration of engagement and participation so common in contemporary society. The curatorial and educational programs should, and in our case, they are placed side by side 
as two forces of equal power, like Siamese twins from the very beginning of the museological planning process. The educational program doesn't come after just to organize a little bit how the students should and teachers should deal with the exhibition. Many times the exhibition is created based on the curricula, on the needs of the schools. Our museums have this horizontality as a mobilizing factor in order to awaken the visitor's curiosity and their permanent desire to learn. I have chosen the trajectory of two of our museums to share here today, both part of urban renovation projects. The first one is MAR in Rio, which we developed in partnership with the City Hall. And the second one is the Portuguese Language Museum in Sao Paulo, located at an historic train station, opened more than 10 years ago. In MAR, the concept of horizontality, of curatorship and education is even represented in the architecture itself. The exhibition pavilion here on the right side and the continuing education school. When you see these two buildings side by side with similar volumetric buildings, perhaps a kind of enigma presents itself. Is it a museum with a school next door or a school with a museum next door? This is an interesting uh, question that addresses all the reflection. And uh, uh, the, the one this morning mentioned in its uh, keynote speaking uh, conference was really wonderful. And the Escola de Olhar that is in the, the, the left building on the right side or left to you is a unique school that tries to broaden cultural perceptions, a place for formation and exchange instead of just training. The teachers are encouraged to confront and problematize the knowledge presented by the museum with the realities in the regular school where they work. Thus, the museum and teachers are able to find new answers and new ways to improve. And what about the Mars collection? How do we have imagined it as a tool of education and social mobilization? Mars' priority is not necessarily to collect blockbuster, but rather pieces that symbolize multiple perspectives of the city of Rio de Janeiro. The collection, which has more than 24,000 items already after four years, is organized in significant nucleuses, such as black slavery, Jewish culture, indigenous and Amazonian culture. The black diaspora nucleus is especially relevant because of the location of Mar, the museum, near the Valongo Pier, the largest slave port in world history. I don't know, I'm not sure, if you all know that 40%, 40% of the Africans who were brought to Americas as a whole to be slaves arrived in Rio. This means about four million people. In North America, only 4% of the Africans brought to be slaves to Americas arrived there. It, it's an amazing number. Brazil, because of this reason, Brazil has submitted this site to UNESCO to be included in the list of World Heritage Sites. UNESCO will decide this July in their conference in Holland. But now, let's take a look at the Jaguataporan exhibition, which aims to reveal the history of Rio as an indigenous history. Even the name Jaguataporan reveals the spirit of the project. It means construction of dialogue in Guarani, an indigenous language. The creation process <coughs> occurred 
in an extremely co collaborative manner, a co-curatorial. We had a curator from the museum and a curator that belongs to the indigenous community of Rio de Janeiro. So we had a wonderful dialogue. Let's see this short video that shows a little bit the process. No. The sound. Uh, caminhar é, junto e caminhar bem, né? Seria um, um conjunto, um coletivo Can you put de the sound caminhar louder? bem. Se eu caminhar sozinho, eu diria aguatá. É, se eu falar que nós guarani, né, caminhamos, seria aroguatá. É uma conversa, é um diálogo de participação de várias pessoas. Não há de Aguataporã né, sem um conflito. Os pesquisadores profissionais do museu foram para a aldeia, para eles sentir também como que é o nosso conhecimento, como que é a nossa organização. Uma das curadoras, que era a Clarissa, foi lá, colocou a proposta para, os, para a comunidade. Ela não precisa ser ou uma exposição de artefatos indígenas, ou uma exposição, né, enfim, sobre a história indígena. E isso significa que ela pode abdicar de muitos dos, dos estereótipos, não só em relação ao índio, mas principalmente também em relação ao museu. Essa exposição, ela vem mostrar a, a própria história de cada povo que está sendo representado. A cobra grande vem a partir dessa ideia, porque cada, cada povo pensa de um jeito. Então, seria a construção do próprio território daquele povo. A liberdade que nós tivemos para expor aquilo que a gente gostaria mesmo de colocar, eu acho que isso foi a grande diferença. Né? Então, isso também está contemplado aqui no museu, né? nessa exposição, porque cada um vai contar de um jeito como que vê o mundo, como que pensa o mundo. Uh, this is a short video, of course, I'm sorry about the technical problems. Just show this collaborative process between curatorship from the museum and curators invited from the community, connected to the uh, roots of the community to produce the, the, the exhibition under a collective view. And this exhibition was and is being a huge success, has unfolded the whole building, occupying the spaces of uh, any uh, of the museum with uh, seminars, debate, fairs, perpetuating dialogue among all the stakeholders involved in its creation. Another interesting, no, let me go back. Another interesting, uh, uh, educational experience of MAR is its integration with a neighboring public school, a kind of adoption of the school that the museum made. We are running an experimental project in which the museum participates effectively in the curriculum development of the school, emphasizing the arts skills of teachers and students. On the other hand, the school community has free access to MAR. That has become a kind of extension of its territory. The public of the school, the teachers, the students, they go every time they went to the museum, during the day, during the classes, period on the intervals and on the beginning, on the end of the school. And to conclude a little bit this example of MAR, it's important to remark that with so many layers, what I'm trying to address is uh, different layers of connecting education with the museum metabolism. Not just having an educational department to take care of visit of schools. This is, I think, makes quite a big difference. And this made MAR become a truly recognized educational hub in Brazil. So it, it's really nice. If you had the opportunity to go to Rio, we would love to receive you there in the museum. Now, let's go to the second case that I brought, just to emphasize a little bit this idea of connection between uh, education and museum, museum and education. And this is the Portuguese language museum. It was the first one in the whole world focused on a national language. Um, 
And even the subject of the museum shows this uh, relevance to the educational aspects to a museum. And, uh, and to create this museum, it was a big challenge because we were creating a museum uh, and especially a long-term exhibition based on, um, on an immaterial and constantly changing heritage as a language. So it's not based in paintings, in sculptures, in artifacts, but it's in a dynamic heritage, completely immaterial. And it, it's important to say that Portuguese is an ancestral language, a universal language, that it is spread across all continents. We are 265 million speakers. And Portuguese is the fourth most spoken language in the world, after Mandarin, Spanish, and English. And it is also, the Portuguese, a miscegenous, a mixed language, the product of many encounters and clashes between different cultures. So, the challenge was how to create this museum. What st story should we tell there? Should this museum present a single story or different aspects of various stories? This was a big discussion among the museum's curatorial and ed educational team. And we believe the Portuguese language museum awakens self-reflection in its visitors. It is a museum, I, I could say, where the public is at the same time the visitor and the object of the visit. After all, we think in Portuguese, we think in our language, we love, we hate in our language, we dream in our language. So, it's really interesting how to get this engagement, this emotional relation with the museum. And we opened it in 2006, and during five years, it was the most visited museum in Brazil. A lot of people, even inside the foundation, said, this is not work, it's a museum about a Portuguese language. But I think it works because it brings the common life, the common Portuguese speaker to the museum as a protagonist. And then I will show you a short video from Professor Robert Darnton from Harvard University after his visit to the museum. Let's try now again. Okay. I went to your museum in Sao Paulo of uh, linguistics and language. It's one of the most wonderful museums I've ever seen. You could actually hear Brazilians speaking so many different versions of the Brazilian Portuguese language that you, you could begin to appreciate the enormous richness of this spoken culture. But I couldn't understand it because I don't know Portuguese. But I could see and hear differences in intonation. And there is something called a, I think it's called a a philological tree. It's a, it's a tree that shows the evolution of words as they move through time. I thought this was terrific. Uh, and there were objects there and photographs there. And I began to glimpse the richness of oral culture in Brazil. As Professor Darnton has just mentioned, in the Portuguese Language Museum, the language is exposed to be seen, to be read, written, spoken, and heard by visitors. For us, it doesn't matter the right or wrong rigor. It is more important to understand and promote language as a common cultural patrimony for all, a spoken culture. Even before its opening in 2006, we began engaging, and this is another kind of layer, how to connect, how to create relations with the educational uh, sectors of society around a museum project. And then we began engaging the educational networks of Sao Paulo, where the museum is, is based, 
And at that time, more than 4,000 teachers of Portuguese language, history, geography, and arts from 700 schools in 170 cities of Sao Paulo State were trained in how to use, I, I, I should emphasize, how to use the museum as a permanent subject in their curriculum and not just as a site for an, an occasional guided excursion. So this is completely different. The teacher has the pedagogical planning of a year or two years or three years, and then he can find different subjects on the museum in order to connect the approach of the whole program of the school. Also, a digital platform was developed to connect all participants in a rich exchange process. It's important to remark that this experience, this experience with a platform to connect everybody was developed about 14 years ago in Brazil to connect the teachers in a space around the museum. During this period, and just to, I'm just getting to the end, uh, the museum held more than 30 temporary exhibitions, not around Picassos or other artists, but around Portuguese authors, literary authors like Fernando Pessoa, uh, uh, Clarice Lispector, and even uh, exhibition around the common use of the language, uh, like this uh, exhibition uh, that we call menas. Menas is a kind of wrong way to say less in Portuguese. Uh, is this right or wrong? Even the language, the traditional language, becomes the correct language during decades, centuries of use. Some mistakes become a right way. So we decided to promote this exhibition also in order to show how important is our language to everyone and not just a tool of communication. Uh, I already said this, but we had a big problem in 2015. A big fire destroyed the museum and uh, unfortunately uh, uh, the museum has to be closed. We are now reconstructing, reconstructing uh, uh, the museum, uh, the museum, it's under reconstruction. Uh, an alliance, not just from Brazil, but Portugal, are around on the museum. And then in 2019, on the very beginning, it will be open again. But however, the dynamic nature of the Portuguese language is allowing the museum to continue its work regardless of the lack of a physical site. This is interesting, this way to relate the museum as a live organism, even after the fire. And then we put on the facade during the works in big letters this concept, the reconstruction, the museum is being rebuilt, but it is the language that is always under construction. This is a kind of paradox that we publicize to show that the museum still exists. But not just that. We are organizing actions outside the museum, inside this train station where the building is, through where about 500,000 people crosses it every day on the underground system. And then we try to create movement, content, engagement from the community with the museum also. And this is the last example during the Portuguese Language Day last May that we made this experience inside the garden. Internacional da Língua Portuguesa apresentou para a gente uma oportunidade de trazer o Museu da Língua de volta a esse contato direto com o público. Depois do incêndio que ocorreu em 2015, 
A gente teve a sede fechada e a gente manteve apenas a, o contato com as nas redes sociais, o site, enfim. E estava faltando essa interação com o público. E aí, sangra minha alma. Sangra minha alma. Minha alma sangra. Sangra minha alma. Se eu quiser conversar com alguém, como nós estamos conversando, eu preciso da língua. Pensar, eu penso através do meu idioma. Se divertir, né? Ou ouvir uma música, tudo isso passa pela língua. Isso é a língua portuguesa, é uma parte, uma porção enorme da nossa cultura. Lembro-me aqui na Estação da Luz. Eu era jovem, com 15 ou 16 anos, e morava em Santana, há 55 anos atrás. Onde eu nasci, passo todo dia, muitas pessoas diferentes, onde aprendi a ser um cidadão. Eu acredito que, mesmo correndo, todo mundo para para ler. E alguma mensagem aqui é, é importante a gente estar tá lendo, não é? Você saber o pensamento de uma pessoa comum, não é? O dia a dia de uma pessoa comum. Todo mundo tem alguma coisa do coração para transmitir, escrever num pedacinho de papel e deixar. Saiu pela minha boca, entrou pelos seus ouvidos. Se for do seu desejo, leve a palavra consigo. Bem, well, com this last short video, I want to thank you so much for your kind attention, your presence here, and I am here to answer any question. Thank you so much, and please,